description. So I will be talking not about astroecology today, but about star formation in um, the central molecular zone. So the inner few hundred parsecs of the galaxy. So I'm going to have two main uh, topics. So first of all, I'm going to uh, talk at large about star formation in the central molecular zone. And then I will share with you um, this uh, ALMA large program that, uh, that we were just talking about before called ACES, the ALMA CMZ to try and uh, understand star formation and feedback in the CMZ. Now, as this is a talk as a part of the this CTA webinar series, I'm going to concentrate really on two main themes throughout the talk. Um, so the first, I'm going to try, uh, and in this very broad umbrella, I'm going to focus on trying to link star formation and feedback in the CMZ with, with this idea of the extreme universe uh, and then the sorts of extreme phenomena that you're going to be observing with the CTA. Then the second part of the talk, so as well as telling you why we're so excited about this ACES data and why we think it's really going to make a step change in our understanding of star, for star formation and feedback. I'd also um, like to encourage people to actually to, to join the project. So this is ACES is open to anyone in the, the Galactic Centre community who's, who's interested. And I think there's, as I hopefully I'll show later in, in the talk, that there's a, a lot of overlap in the sorts of science questions that, that we're asking. It'd be great to have input from uh, members of the high energy community so that we can make our data as, as uh, useful as possible and hopefully work on some of these science questions together. Okay, so on to the first part of the talk, star formation in and feedback in the central molecular zone. Uh, an outstanding review written on this topic by Johnny Henshaw uh, and collaborators. So this is a, a review that's part of something called the Proto Stars and, and Planets series. And, and in planet formation and star formation, this review is held every seven years. Um, and every seven years, the community gets together and there are uh, they pick a small number of reviews on, on key topics. And Johnny's leading one of these these topics and a lot of what I'll be talking about today is summarized really nicely in his, his review and I would encourage you uh, if you're interested to contact Johnny uh, about this. It's really uh, an excellent review and I should say um, that a lot of the slides I'll be using so the really nice visuals and things were, were made by, by Johnny for this talk. Okay so to go through this is a very broad topic star formation and feedback in the central molecular zones. So I've broken it down into four um, main themes or, or topics. So I'm going to start really uh, quite briefly with this a broad, big picture uh, context. So why do we study? Uh, we've already touched on this in the, in the introduction to, to this talk, which is spot on, but I'll just kind of go over that, maybe flesh it out a bit more, and why we're interested in centres of galaxies and, and why the CMZ, why our own galactic centre in particular. And then I'm going to dive in a bit more detail to um, our current understanding of star formation and feedback. So I'm going to do this by um, explaining this long-standing puzzle that we have uh, in the galactic center. And that's that when we look at the star formation rate, it appears to be uh, much, much lower than we would expect, given how much dense gas there is. So well, I'll sort of dive into that, explain this puzzle, and then I uh, give you a flavor for where we currently stand um, in trying to address this puzzle. Okay, so then why are we interested in galactic nuclei? Well, this whole talk series is on on extreme universe and, and I don't think there are many other places in the universe quite as extreme as, as the centers of galaxies. I think we can all all agree on that. Um, obviously they host supermassive black holes and you know even in and of themselves they're some of the most extreme objects in in the universe for testing GR and so on. But surrounding these these um, supermassive black holes there are uh, the, the centers of galaxies have huge gas reservoirs uh, and, and these huge gas reservoirs produce lots of stars and in fact the centers of galaxies can account for up to this sort of the, the prodigious uh, outflow and then feedback and energetic activities um, from, from supernovas and wind and so on and um, can but play a key role in shaping galaxy populations so I think it's it's fair to say that the centers of galaxies and really as we look out into the universe trying to understand why it looks the way it does then the centers of galaxies have played a key role in, uh, in shaping that. So what about our own galactic centre? Uh, what uh, what can we what what role can that play in this uh, in, in this sort of trying to build our understanding? Well, I think that the single main thing, certainly for me, that, that makes it stand out is it's the only place where we can really zoom in down to the scales of individual 
stars and follow the gas as it flows down into the, the central supermassive black hole. Now, for, for other galaxies, we can get a great understanding of things on sort of kiloparsec scales, maybe for nearby galaxies down to 10 parsec scales. But what's driving these huge, like the, these energetic processes, these, these galactic scale outflows, are, um, are driven on, you know, sub to tenth of a parsec scale. So really all the way down to uh, thousands of AU where the, the, these energetic processes are being launched. And within our lifetime, the centre of our galaxy is the only place that we're, we're going to be able to do that. It's the only place we can link the kiloparsec scale galactic processes that, that drive um, things down to these small scales. And then when we when the, the feedback starts, um, we can follow it back up again. So that really is unique. And we have to base our understanding on the centre of our galaxy. Now, not only that, that's kind of baryonic processes, but of course, like one of CTA's um, key science goals is, is looking for um, possible uh, evidence of, of dark matter, maybe self self annihilation signals. And the centre of our galaxy is um, is a great place to to look for this. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the galactic centre, so the gamma ray excess. Um, it's obviously debated the, the origin of that, but what is is clear, no matter what you think it might be is that if you want to look for dark matter self-annihilation, you've got to get rid of the contaminants. You've got to get rid of the, the other stuff that, you know, is interesting for me, but is, is garbage uh, that you need to get rid of if you're looking for dark matter signals. And, and of course, the centre of our galaxy, we can resolve individual um, uh, contaminants. So I think it's clear that the understanding, ho hopefully that's a big picture, it's clear that understanding star formation and feedback in the CMZ really is, is important. So um, I think that's why this, this long-standing puzzle continues to draw so much, uh, so much attention. So I'll explain what that is. Well, when you go out and you take any telescope and you point it at the center of the galaxy and you measure how quickly it's converting its gas into stars, you, you see that it's doing it much less than you would expect. So typically the star formation rate is one to two orders of magnitude less than you'd uh, typically expect. Um, so why is that important? Well, if uh, if we said star formation and feedback uh, in galactic centres plays a key role driving galaxy evolution, so if it's different, if star formation and feedback is somehow different in extreme environments like the centre of our galaxy, it's crucial to understand how and why. So I'm going to spend the next few slides kind of diving into this puzzle. Uh, we're going to start, I'll give, uh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the galactic centres, so I'm going to start by giving a sort of observational, very brief overview of what the centre of the galaxy looks like, what kind of phenomena happen in there uh, to, to get a feel. Hopefully that'll be helpful for the, the rest of the talk where we start looking at the physics. Um, so we'll have an overview, then we'll look at how we derive star formation rates um, before uh, we go on to, to explain what why it's lower than expected, what does expected mean. Okay, and then finally, once we've done that, I'll bring it all back together and sort of try to link it to this big picture stuff of why, why, all, all, why all of this is important and for understanding star formation in extreme environments. Okay, so here is a sort of a, a very brief and observationally uh, driven uh, overview of what the center of the galaxy looks like. So we're going to build up this multi-wavelength picture. So I'm going to start here and you'll see down, down the bottom, there's this bar and that is going to tell you what uh, the wavelength of light is that we're, we're currently looking at. So we're going to start with this all sky view, this beautiful guy picture uh, in the optical um, uh, and you're seeing there, of course, this, this bright banded across the middle is the, the, the plane of our galaxy. These dark features are the, are nearby by gas clouds. And unfortunately, in optical wavelengths, we can't uh, see the center of the galaxy because of all the dust in the way. So what we're going to do, that white box is there showing the inner few hundred parsecs. So we're going to zoom in spatially and we're going to move from the optical into the, uh, to the infrared. So this is now looking, um, so you see down the bottom right, that's going to tell you uh, exactly the wavelengths. And above the image tells you what physics, what, what physical things we're looking at. So this is a Spitzer image. And in this, this uh, image here, the blue is uh, where I'm telling you where the hot stars are distributed in the inner few hundred parsecs. Oh, sorry, sorry, there's a scale bar on the top left as well. Um, so we're looking at probably a few hundred parsecs uh, around the center. So the blue is, is the hot stars. The green and red uh, is a mission from very small dust grains that's been excited by the UV radiation from, from high mass stars. And when we can peer through the dust, we see some familiar features. So right there in the middle, that's the center of the galaxy. So there's a supermassive black hole hidden away in there somewhere. What you're actually seeing there is the, is the, the, the nuclear cluster surrounding 
Sag A star. Uh, there are some uh, well-known and famous clusters, the arches and quintuplet, uh, just to, to the left on this, this image. Um, but what you should also see there are these very uh, distinct absorption features. And it's these that got me certainly uh, quite a while ago interested in the galactic center. Because this is, if you look down at the bottom right, this is eight microns is the longest wavelength. So these things are showing up as absorption features at eight microns. Um, so in order to do that, the amount of dust, the column you have uh, is very large. These must be contain a lot of material. And in fact, some of these clouds are even dark at 70 microns, which means they must have visual extinctions of a thousand magnitudes or more. So these are crazy compared to what clouds you would typically see in the disks of galaxies. They're incredibly dense. And so I, I got interested in these in studying these objects. And if instead of looking in the infrared, so now we're going to go to longer wavelengths, and instead of um, 70 microns, 8 microns, 70 microns, they're still optically thick. If we go past the peak of the black body, we start to see that they, they glow. So now red here is um, the, the emission from the cold dust. And you can see that the, the inner few hundred parsecs is crammed full of very dense molecular uh, clouds shown, shown in here. And the blue in this, this picture, sorry, so the red is from, from Herschel, uh, and the blue is the, the emission from, from hot dust and, and young stars. So you can also see, just um, it says embedded star formation, that there are also some very luminous objects. Um, so this down here where it says embedded star formation. So my pointer isn't working for some reason, otherwise I'd put my mouse over it. Um, so there are also signs of prodigious star formation activity. So that's Sagittarius B2 there where it says embedded star formation. And that's currently, the it's basically a mini starburst. It's forming, it's 10 to the six solar masses. Uh, a gas cloud and forming, currently forming stars like crazy. In fact, half of the, the star formation, current star formation in the galactic center is happening there. We can see even more energetic processes if we now go from the submilliliter all the way into the radio. So this is now 30 centimeters with, with meerkats in, in red. And you start to see um, supernova remnants popping up and you can peer right in and see all this embedded star formation that's happening around. Your eyes probably immediately drawn, if you haven't seen this image already, to these uh, non-thermal radio filaments. And if you're uh, uh, particularly good at noticing these sorts of things, you might see two vertical, again, I'm sorry, my, my point is not working, two vertical um, uh, features that are, that are broader. And, and we think these, this is the, the base of a, a very large outflow that's been, been uh, driven for the energetic event a few million years ago. So I, I love this image so much, this meerkat image. I can't resist showing it in all, all its detail, um, just to get across the point that there are there is so much, uh, so much activity, so many um, uh, highly energetic processes going off at the same time in here. So if you're interested in the high energy universe, so to the very right hand side of the scale bar, then this is a great place to look. Uh, I can't just uh, as a little plug at this came out the other day. This is the new meerkat image. And if you have a chance, uh, you've got spare 10 minutes, I encourage you to have a look because it's the data is just quite, quite jaw dropping. The, the level of detail here is, um, is quite remarkable. OK, so uh, that was a, a bit of a, a whistle, whistle stop to a very observational, um, hopefully give you a, a feel for what, uh, what sorts of things are, are going on in the center of the galaxy. But, but there's two main things really to take from that going forward. So number one is that we have a very large reservoir of very dense gas clouds. And simultaneously, there's a high concentration of energetic phenomena, things like supernova, um, uh, uh, young stars forming star clusters. And so what we want to now do is to compare those things to other environments. And in order to do that, we need to go from just this very qualitative picture of, yes, there's dense gas clouds, yes, there's supernova, and to, to, to measure quantitative values for that. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to uh, now try and uh, measure this. So how do we do that? Well, this is um, my most boring slide. Uh, I apologize. Um, but it's just to try and get across the point that there are many, many ways to do this. So I think showing a table in a talk is, is terrible. I won't spend too long on it. Um, but I just get across the point that many people have done this um, using many different methods. So typically what you do is you will take your favorite um, signpost for star formation. It could be a supernova or or young stellar objects, YSOs, or you might take all the integrated light and try and uh, understand how much of that is from star formation. Um, and so once you've picked your favorite indicator, you can estimate a time scale for you know, how long does that emission last. You can estimate the mass of the object that's producing it. You can divide one by the other and you get your star formation rate. Um, so as I say, this is a terribly boring, boring plot. 
but it's just to, to get across a point that lots of people have done this. Uh, and uh, the, the take home message is at the top is that no matter what you do, no matter what star formation tracer you pick, um, you always end up that this, the current star formation in the CMZ is about 0 0.07 solar masses per year. Uh, that's if you measured in the past a few million years, but there is also um, some cheeky evidences that there might have been um, uh, an elevated star formation rate over the past 30 million years that are the observations we look at, so supernova remnants and the young stellar objects might not be sensitive to. So there's a the paper which suggests that, the, you know, the evidence for this might be things like the arches and quintuplet clusters that are very massive. Uh, uh, clusters that formed probably, you know, in the five to 10 million years uh, ago range. Uh, so there might be a, a spike, possibly up to 0.8 solar masses per year within the last 30 million years. Okay, so we've got a measure of star formation rate. And what we now want to do is to compare that star formation rate with that dense gas reservoir, and then compare to other star formation rate and dense gas, dense gas reservoirs across the universe to see if they're similar or not. And it just so happens that uh, there was a really nice paper that did this by Charlie Ladder back in 2012. So Charlie did the hard work here of going through the literature and measuring uh, all of the uh, collating dense gas measurements um, from all the way from gas clouds on the far bottom left in green are clouds in the Milky Way, and then all the way up in mass, so sorry, masses on dense gas masses is on the X axis. So in log 10 solar masses per year, um, going from sort of 10 up to 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses, so a very big dynamic range in mass. Um, so all the way from, from galactic clouds, clouds nearby Earth, uh, all the way up to high redshift galaxies up in the top right. So that's the masses on the x-axis, the mass of dense gas on the x-axis. And then the y-axis is a measure of the star formation rate. And so this is the, the plot from Charlie's paper. And the really nice and exciting thing about this was that everything fit, seemed to fit on the same line, and that line was linear. So everything from the Milky Way clouds all the way up to high redshift galaxies appeared to fit on this really nice line. And the, the interpretation of that is that perhaps there's a universal density for star formation. Now, the reason that this is so interesting uh, if it's right, is because that means, the kind of implication of that means that if you study the things way down in the bottom left of the plot, if you can study um, nearby star forming regions, which of course you can see in so much more detail than you can high redshift galaxies, then if you can understand what's going on in there, that will tell you everything you need to know about these high redshift galaxies. So if this is right, it's really important. So what do we expect the, the CMZ to be in there, our own galaxy? Well, we've already said that all the observational evidence suggests the star formation rate is about 0.1 solar mass per year. So that's minus one on the y-axis and you can draw in your head or on the screen a, a line across. So we'd expect there to be about 10 to the six or 10 to the seven solar masses of dense gas there. Um, but what we in fact find is that there's way more gas than or at least an order of magnitude more dense gas. So flipping that around, another way of putting it is that Given the amount of dense gas in there, the, the center of the galaxy is under producing stars by a lot. So the, this little inset on the top left here is if you take away, so the, everything fits on the slope. If you normalize, um, get rid of that slope, uh, and then the blue are showing extra galactic centers. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the CMZ, so the, the, the solid dashed line is, the, is where everything should line if, if it was uniform, if there was a universal density threshold, and the CMZ is at least an order of magnitude lower than that. So that is intriguing, that's the puzzle. Why is this so different? It's annoying because if everything was the same, we could understand star formation, but it's not, it's different. Some physics is making that gas different. Okay, so is this seem said just weird? What about other uh, centers of other galaxies? So what you really want to do, so if we, if we go back to this plot here, you see there's lots of blue, or the hexagons. So that there's lots of measurements of nearby galaxies, but all these galaxies are different. They're different masses, they're different types. Um, so comparing to the CMZ is not an apples to apples comparison. So what you really want to do is find um, a twin of the Milky Way. And it just so happens that um, M83 is a nearby galaxy and what I'm showing you here in the left column is uh, the central molecular zone of the Milky Way, and the right column is the central molecular zone of M83. So again, there's loads of information here. It's a boring slide in, in many ways, but the, the key things to take away 
is that most of the, the, the key physical properties you might care about, you know, the mass, the, the, the gas content, stellar content, the velocity dispersion of the gas, metallicity, all these things are, you know, very, very similar between the two galaxies. But notice the star formation rates. The CMZ, as we said, is only 0 0.07 solar masses per year, uh, 0 0.07 solar masses per year star formation rate, whereas the um, in center of M83, it's an order of magnitude higher, it's 0.8 solar masses per year. So what is going on? This is, uh, we went looking for, for twins uh, of our galaxy, but we found uh, a twin that we didn't really expect. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here, so it's time to, it's like to kind of stop and reflect where, where we've got to uh, and set the stage for, for going forward. Okay, so we, we said right at the start, uh, and, and we know that um, star formation and feedback in galaxy centers plays a key role in, in the shaping the evolution of galaxy populations. So if there is an environmental change in star formation, it's crucial we understand why. And we've just seen certainly that the research over the past you know, five, 10 years that has shown that the CMZ is underproducing stars by one to two orders of magnitude, given how much dense gas it contains. So what's going on? Well, we've basically got one of two uh, possible scenarios here, uh, two potential explanations. Either the, the, the star formation in the central molecular zone is currently at a low point in the star formation history and then uh, will, will rise again at some point, or there's something that's actively inhibiting star formation at the center of the galaxy. And you might say, well, yeah, so what? You know, who, who cares? Why, why do we even care about this? Well, we should care. And the reason is because the extent to which feedback changes a galaxy depends really sensitively on the, the spatial and temporal distribution of that feedback. And, and a very simple um, analogy or, or, or way in this context. So we say the, the star formation rate is currently 0 0.07 solar masses per year. And let's imagine that we just let the, the CMZ trundle along at that rate for the next 20 million years, and then we should observe it in 20 million years. Now, instead of that, imagine we, we take that same integrated star formation, but we cram it down into a 2 million year window in a very small uh, spatial uh, region, the galaxy is going to look completely different. So the first scenario, there's no way that could ever drive anything like the Fermi bubble. There's just not enough accumulated energy. All the energy will, will the, of the star formation supernova will, will dissipate and cool uh, before it can do anything on a galactic scale, whereas the latter scenario is going to cause serious damage, drive uh, large-scale outflows, and so on. So we should really care uh, strongly, and if, and if we're interested in looking at these phenomena with high-energy telescopes like CTA, it's really important that we understand which of these two scenarios we're talking about. Okay, so what are some potential solutions to this puzzle? Okay, so um, we've got these two scenarios and uh, through, I guess, in investigations of the last few years, we narrowed it down. There's two plausible uh, physical mechanisms that can be responsible for this. So if the case is that uh, we're presently observing star formation um, in a kind of a, a low state and it's gonna go back up again, then the obvious physical mechanism for, for doing that is, is large scale process. So galactic scale processes um, are, are driving this spatial and temporal variation in, in star formation. Whereas if, if this is, you know, if the star formation is low and it remains low over long periods, then there has to be something that's locally um, causing star formation to be different, to be suppressed for a given amount of dense gas um, in the center of the galaxy. So these are the two things that we, we want to investigate. And we want to understand if that's true, what could be causing this? Okay, so let's go, I'm gonna go through each of those in turn. So let's, um, first of all, could it be galactic scale processes? Well, to see if galactic scale processes are, are responsible, we need to understand what we think drives them in the first place. So uh, a, good, a good place to start is why, why do we have a CMZ at all in the first place? Not all galaxies do. Um, so what, what you're seeing here, this is a, um, an, an, a top-down view of what we, an artist's impression of what we think our galaxy might look like. And probably the, the key factor in all of this, your eyes already been drawn to, and that's the fact that we have a bar. We have a stellar bar, like two thirds of all spiral galaxies in the local universe, we have a stellar bar. And that stellar bar does nasty stuff to the, the, the gas in the disk. So the stellar bar uh, is rotating, and as it rotates, the gas and disk uh, uh, near the, the, the end of the bar feels a torque, 
And, and because gas is dissipational, it can shock, it can lose energy, it can lose momentum, and then it can plunge in uh, along the leading edge of the bar into the center. So we've got a good uh, idea of what's going on here. So there's great work by, um, so some simulations here by uh, Matthias Romani, uh, Robin Tress and uh, Ralph Klesson, um, uh, their, their group uh, showing how this works in practice. So they've taken the simulation of a Milky Way-like galaxy, they put in a Milky Way-like bar, uh, and you can see, so the different panels, it's the same simulation, they've just done different processing. So the top left is the total gas, then stepping through, you see the atomic gas, then molecular gas, and going down, um, you see the CO, so that's what we'd actually observe, carbon monoxide emission there. And on the sort of bottom left image of the simulation is the star formation uh, going on. So we have a good understanding. If we know what the potential, the gravitational potential of the bar is, we've got a fair idea of what um, of what's happening. And it's basically these the gas comes in in what we see in external galaxy are dust lanes. Now the important point is that the gas, um, because of the gravitational potential, the gas buildup. We can see these um, these rings. Uh, sorry, saying that my internet is unstable. Are, are you? Am I still? Can people still hear me? Can someone just say hi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll okay, you're fine. Right. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so so the gas, so the, one particularly important thing to notice is that, so the gas is funneled in, but you see that there's these, these uh, this ring that builds up, and that's because of the stellar, uh, the stellar potential, which is dominant in uh, so far in towards the galactic center, um, basically sets up a stalling point where, where the gas builds up in, in a ring. So that's what we, we observe. That is, the, the central molecular zone that we're talking about, the inner few hundred parsecs where this gas piles up on the ring. Now, we're interested in this question, is star formation static? Is it quasi-continuous or is it bursty? So, well, hopefully simulations will give us the answer, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, there are two different uh, different answers there. So what I'm showing you here that are, are star formation, uh, so simulations of a disk like the Milky Way with a bar, and following the gas in and asking the question, is star formation um, bursty or, or quasi-continuous? So the one on the left, this is um, by uh, Lucia Armalotta, um, showing some results from, from her simulations, uh, where you've got the so star formation rate is on the, the, the y-axis on the top plot, and then the time in, in mega years. Uh, and so in, in her simulations, she finds that star formation is, is, is very bursty. Uh, so the, the Sort of orange uh, horizontal stripe is the, the current estimate of the, the CMZ's, um, our own um, galaxy's um, star formation rate of sort of 0.1 solar masses per year. And so her simulations do get down there, but it's, it's, it's a kind of low point. And then there's like big bursts of star formation. So that's, these simulations are very bursty. So on the right hand side, these are our um, simulations by uh, Matthias Ormani, and they find something different. In their simulations, again, global, global simulations, gas falling in, um, their, their star formation rates are much more, more continuous. So uh, I think the certainly on the, on the simulation side that this is still an, an, an open question. Okay, so let's look at it from, um, so simulations, you know, are working, working this out. What about from the observational perspective? Well, we can try and tackle this by asking what happens to gas when it enters the central like the zone and, and we can we can do that in a very simple uh, mass budget type approach so we can say right we know gas is getting funneled in we know it builds up in this ring and so we can just ask how much is coming in how much is going out how much is going into stars and by doing this kind of mass budget we can estimate is it likely you know do all those masses cancel out in other words are we in a quasi-continuous thing or does it look like there's a, a sort of a mismatch um between the mass coming in and mass coming out, and maybe that's some indication that, that we, we're having we're star formation is bursty. Okay, so this is um, what I'm showing you here. This is a very simple uh, attempt to do that. So on the left hand side, we've got m dot in, which is the sort of mass inflow rate coming along these dust lanes into the center. And SFR, that's the, the current star formation rate. m dot out is the, the rate at which gas has been blown out of the CMZ. And then the m dot CMZ is the, the, the um, the change in mass of the stars in, uh, so, so change of the mass of the gas in the CMZ. Okay, so we've already said, let's look at these terms. We've already said the star formation rate is about 0.1 solar mass per year currently. Um, we can measure uh, the mass 
In flow rate is about one solar mass per year. So this is a paper by uh, Matthias Romani and, and, and Ash Barnes, where they, they picked out this figure just beneath that is, is showing um, uh, the, the CO position velocity diagram, and you can pick out the dust lanes, that's what's shown in the blue and orange. You can measure uh, the, the mass of the CO in those two, two components. And then if you've got a model of the galaxy, you can get a, a rate at which it comes in. And their number is about one solar mass per year. So the rate at which gas is being expelled is about 0 0.6 um, solar masses. And here's, uh, you know, I just, I still, I'm blown away by this, just the, the sheer scale of this. Um, but it's clear that the, the large amount of, of mass is being blown uh, out from uh, the central molecular zone. I, I like doing this as an observer, is that I can tell that um, the right-hand side uh, must be building up. So in order for this to, to match one solar mass per year, then the, the amount of gas that's in the CMZ must be, must be growing if those other numbers are right. So this may be observational. Again, this is sort of very hand-wavy and, and there's quite a bit of uncertainty in these numbers, but this is potentially observational evidence that, that the star formation is bursty in um, the, the CMZ. Okay, so it certainly says, so going back to our, our original, you know, two-pronged idea or two, two different mechanisms, it certainly seems that um, variations on, on large sort of kiloparsec galactic scales may play a role in the reason why the star formation rate seems low at the moment. Um, so what about this other idea of kind of more local processes somehow um, keeping star formation very low over a, a long time? So, well, before we, we get there, what do we mean by extreme? We need to quantify that before we can understand what physical mechanisms might cause it to be extreme. So here we go, this is the same top-down view of the galaxy. And one thing that we can say about um, the star formation in the center of uh, the, the gas in the center is that it's really very dense. So just to give you an idea, a flavor for that, so the inner, say, few hundred parsec, it contains between 3 and 10% of all the molecular gas in the galaxy. And yet the surface area is 0.1%. So that tells you immediately just those two numbers that compared to the gas in the rest of the disk, this gas is super dense. So that's number one. So that could be um, the reason. But then that would be strange because all, uh, all star formation models think that as you uh, increase the density of the gas, then your star formation should go up. So this is one thing that's different but it's different in the wrong way, completely the wrong way. So what might be stopping it? Well, another thing that we know about the, set, the gas in the center of the galaxy is it's incredibly turbulent. So what does that mean? It means that there is a lot that, for a given fixed size scale, if you take a molecular cloud in the disk and a molecular cloud in the galactic center, and you have to measure how much kinetic energy there is in the gas on the same size scale in both, there's way more kinetic energy in the galactic center clouds. And that's what's shown um, here, this is a, a typical line width um, size relationship for, for clouds. Um, so the x-axis is you, you go around and you measure clouds in the disk and clouds in the center, and, and you plot their size. That uh, should be in, in parsecs um, on the, the x-axis. Uh, and then in the y-axis, you, you measure on that same size scale, you observe something like CO and you measure the velocity dispersion of that line. And so you have a size and you have a line width and you plot them. And so you can see the, the yellow are the CMZ clouds. And for a fixed size scale, if you go up in, uh, you take a fixed size scale on the x-axis and you go up in the y-axis, you see that the CMZ clouds are, um, can be 10 times greater the velocity dispersion. And that means there's, there's a lot more kinetic energy in the gas. So that clearly is an important consideration when you're thinking about star formation. And, and star formation is basically um, self-gravity of the gas fighting against um, things like kinetic energy and, and so on that are trying to stop it collapsing. So that's obviously important. And indeed, um, so that's, so the gas is denser, it's more turbulent. And in fact, um, we can expand that for pretty much any property, um, you know, you said turbulence, but also magnetic fields, gas temperatures, density, pressure, cosmic reionization rates, all of these things are uh, an order of magnitude or more greater in the, the galactic center than the solar neighborhood. So pretty, what do we mean by extreme? We say, you take any measure, um, any physical property, and it will be at least an order of magnitude larger in the galactic center. And you'd think, surely that's got to play some role in uh, affecting the star formation and also the feedback as well. So when stars do form and the feedback goes off, it must play a role. Okay, so um, 
this is a, a very visual, again, another thing that when I started looking at the Galactic Center kind of blew my mind. Um, uh, and uh, let me show you that. And, and I, still, I still find it quite amazing. So what I want to do is when we say dense and extreme, how dense is dense? So this, let's look at this little cloud here. It's one of my, my favorite objects are called, called the brick. And this is one of the, the sort of densest um, and most massive molecular clouds in the galaxy uh, that doesn't have any signs of, of star formation. So that's it shown here. This is uh, the, the, the red is a Herschel and then this beautiful uh, yellow orange image here. This is uh, an, an Alma uh, showing individual star forming cores uh, in this, this gas cloud. So that just looks, you know, it's easy to, to take that for granted, but it only, uh, the, the scale of how extreme this is only becomes important when we compare that to something in the disk. So now what I've done here is I've taken that gas cloud and I've compared it in size to the Orion molecular cloud. Now Orion is our um, local um, extreme star formation environment. It's the nearest place in the galaxy where we're forming high mass stars. And it's often looked to as you know our, our nearest extreme example of star formation. So actually what has happened, this is showing, so you see the, the Orion filament here, and that's about 10 to the five solar masses of gas, and that's forming stars like crazy. What the universe has somehow managed to do is to cram all of that gas. So that tiny little gas cloud there is the same amount of gas as in the whole Orion cloud. It's managed to compress all of that down to a radius of a few parsecs and stop it forming stars. So that that to me, that that is extreme. How the, the sort of physical question we're entering is what what can stop the this gas cloud from forming stars as you compress it uh, to, to such a degree. So we have um, a fair idea of, of what might be, be causing that. Uh, it's a combination of, of, of different things. Um, obviously, increase in magnetic, uh, magnetic fields, uh, the huge amounts of, of kinetic energy in that gas. And the gas is effectively being pushed to very, very high densities um, by things like the, the external pressure and by the, the, the strong surrounding gravitational field. And a lot of the gas is dense, but it's not self-gravitating. So there's a figure is trying to show that here. So what there's a paper we published a few years ago. We take this spectacular Alma image of this gas cloud, and we ask the question: Well, what does its what's its density distribution look like? So we've got this the 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 image uh, here in in orange. On the left, what we've done is we've done um, a probability density function of the column density. Uh, so on the x-axis is basically the the density of the cloud. Uh, and on the, the y-axis is basically the number of pixels at that density. So you can see this is makes a really sort of nice log normal shape, and that's what you get predicted um, by uh, if, if the gas is, is very turbulent. I can explain why that is if, if, if anyone's interested. Uh, but uh, the key point here is that that vertical dotted line here, this is that universal density threshold. So remember the, the, the ladder uh, plot I showed where everything was lying on this nice line. The, the prediction here is that at a density of about 10 to the 4 particles per centimetre cubed, everything begins forming stars. And what was clear from this Alma map is that pretty much all of this gas cloud is above that density, and yet virtually none of it's forming stars. The only bit that's forming stars is this tiny little bit that's just off that log normal at the very high density. And this one little clump in here that we now know, this is another beautiful Alma image that made by Dan Walker. This is now on sort of 1,000 AU scales, where you can see these are little protostellar outflows coming from, from stars right within, within there. But most of this cloud is doing diddly squat. It's above this density and it's doing nothing. So uh, that can't be, uh, so it cannot be a universal density threshold. There has to be additional physics that's stopping this cloud from stars. And so there's been lots of work on this. And um, this is just calculations if, if people are interested. The take home message is that um, the in local environment is really important. It really matters on these small scales. If you have a lot of um, uh, excess velocity, uh, emotions, whether that, you know, the kinetic energy in the gas, that can be from injected from shear, it can be, uh, for, for, for whatever reason, if you have strong magnetic fields, all of these things mean that, that star formation is strongly environmentally dependent. This, this just right, what I'm showing you here, fundamentally rules out star formation um, being environmentally independent. It just, it, it can happen. So we know that star formation must be environmentally dependent. The question is, what is the key physics that's driving that? Okay, so we had these two potential 
um, explanations. And unfortunately, as always seems to be the case, it, it looks like probably both of them play a role. Um, both galactic scale processes, the things that drive the gas in and shape the, the big uh, picture, uh, shape the sort of big scale uh, gas motions, but also what's happening right down on the size scales of individual forming stars. Um, both of these things, and in fact, it's probably the case that they uh, completely in interact with each other, uh, and it's uh, you know it's uh, a sort of oh, ah, where are we? How do we make progress on this? Well, that's where we get to ACES. So ACES, the the Alma CMZ Exploration Survey, and its goal is to do exactly that. So ACES is going to derive the, the, the properties of all of this star forming gas all the way from 100 parsec scales um, all the way down to individual forming star scales and it's going to measure uh, the, 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 the gas, the young stars um, and everything in between from all of these different scales. So I'm going to spend the last probably two minutes just giving you a very quick lot submillimeter experts. So uh, there's a whole lot of information these slides I can come back to if people are interested in. Um, but I just want to really spend time on, on one key figure, and that's this um, figure here. So what we're showing you here, there's lots of different colours. I like to draw your attention to everything except the red. So the red is aces, that everything except the red was what was there before. So the galactic centre is one of the most highly studied regions in the sky, and there have been lots of pencil beam studies of this object and that object, and we've learned a lot about star formation. But the thing that's been missing is we ha have had no way, it's been completely, each object is a little isolated island. So if you look at the, the blue and the orange, there are these little pencil beams, and we've not been able to link that to the, the, the big scales that we now know are crucial in setting the small scale scale properties. And again, it's the small scale properties that then feed back. So ACES, what one of the, the, the real step changes is that the, the red outline, so this is the inner 200 parsecs, ACES is going to map the whole thing, all of this red, all of that dense class, all of the dense gas clouds, all of where, where we saw the supernova remnants and the and the young stellar objects and the, and the very centre, all of it from um, like 200 parsec scales all the way down, so it's down to one arc second, 0.05 parsecs, and a whole bunch of different lines, and it will measure all of the, you know, uh, have a complete census of everything down to 0.2 kilometers a second resolution. So that's um, about the, 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 the thermal, about the thermal length. Um, so yeah, there's, I'm going to skip over, there's a whole bunch of, please, a uh, whole bunch of information on this, you know, what lines we're looking at, what sensitivities are, um, you know, what the sort of structure of the project is and, and our key sort of science goals. I'm happy to come back to that. I'm not really sure what people are interested in. So I've got lots of information there. Um, but um, it's very easy to join. If you're interested, it's just the case of, you know, contacting myself or one of the other um, co-PIs and filling out a Google form. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd love to have you, have you join, um, you know, just even even a discussion if you want to join us discussing how, how can we make this data available most uh, useful for the high energy community that would be absolutely fantastic so please do uh, do that right that is so i just saw there was a question in the chat i'll come back to that um oh dear i can't sorry i've lost my cursor uh, no problem, Steve. I, I can read it. So there was a question uh, from David. Uh, could you hear me, Steve? Okay. Yes. So there was right. a question. So I've I've got one more slide. Should I just finish with my my last slide? Okay. Uh, if I can move it. So I'm I'm having. I don't know if you can hear that. My thing seems to have frozen. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, so finally, sorry about that little technical hitch. So final slide, what role can uh, studies of the CMZ play? Well, right at the start, we're seeing that the, the CMZ is the nearest environment that we can simultaneously observe many of the extreme processes that shape the universe. Uh, but it's our, you know, understanding the star formation feedback is currently limited by 
the lack of this kind of unified framework from thinking from, from the, the 100 parsec scales down to individual uh, star formation uh, and feedback points. And the ACEs will uh, sort of bridge that gap um, and it's open to the community. Um, so if you're interested, please let me know. And that is my final slide.